Hi everyone, I'm Zoe Goodman. Um, I'm one of the co-organisers of this uh, Climate Change in Coastal Cities uh, Symposium together with Paul Rabe and Shaolan Lin. And I just wanted to say hi to all of you and a few introductory words about myself and my own interest in, in this um, topic. So uh, I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Warwick and uh, I've previously held positions at both um, IIAS and um, SOAS. And I think it's really weird to be making this video this week um, in a moment in which we've had just sort of insane, uh, insanely predictable, uh, horrific weather events, um, whether in Hunan, in China, in Belgium, in Siberia, in the east coast of the US, um, places the world is kind of flooding and burning and uh, yeah, I mean, all, all at once. Um, and, and I think at the same time as we've had these kind of really uh, horrific and horrifically predictable um, extreme weather events, we've also this week been kind of <laughs> hounded by uh, elite politicians and entrepreneurs um, making ridiculous remarks um, about climate change. Um, to give just two examples, uh, I think it was actually last week, uh, Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, said that you know his sort of joyride mission to space, uh, what someone has described as the most expensive midlife crisis ever, um, his joyride to space was really uh, actually supporting uh, a kind of sustainable future for the planet because ultimately missions like his would enable us to eventually um, get rid of all polluting industries and send them off into space, which I mean has been wi widely criticized as sort of blatant climate denialism and a complete rejection of the fact that climate change is happening now and there is no kind of technological sweet fix that is going to get out of this get us out of this crisis. Um, and the second was actually this morning, I heard it on the radio, the British radio, um, of uh, the um, one of the sort of ministers in the government who's now the spokesperson for the upcoming COP26 um, talks, which will be held this year in Glasgow later, later this year. Um, she is quoted as saying, uh, maybe all of us could do our bit uh, for climate change by avoiding doing the washing up. Uh, sorry, avoiding washing up, rinsing our plates uh, before we put them in the dishwasher. So this kind of extremely micro um, intervention into, uh, into kind of addressing the climate crisis. And I think again this shows like a sort of fundamental misunderstanding of, of the climate crisis as, as sort of profoundly produced by racial capitalism and by structures um, that need to be addressed far beyond sort of um, minute uh, interventions at the at the domestic level. At the same time, I think what both of these comments demonstrate um, the sort of uh, is not only the um, the sort of the loss the um, <clears throat> ineptitude of elites in addressing this uh, in addressing the climate crisis but also how critical it is that we do as social scientists and humanities scholars that we do research um, into the different ways that people are understanding climate change on the ground and are um, uh, uh, yeah um, sort of working towards um, So, uh, sort of conceptualizing and, and, and dealing with climate change in their everyday lives. So I think it makes the, the sort of focus of our co of our conference all the more important and relevant in a way. Um, just to say a few very brief words, sorry, a few very brief words on how I got interested in this topic. Um, I started to realize a few years into doing research in Mombasa that um, while at first climate change was really absent in my in my field notes, over the years uh, I started to, to notice more and more people making comments um, about uh, their observations of, of increasingly um, shifting weather, weather events. And I was always struck right from the outset by how much people um, were aware and sort of tracked changes in the weather 
um, through experiences in their own domestic spaces, through experiences in their own homes. Um, for example, uh, people would tell me, you know, I've lived in this house for 30 years and it flooded for the very first time last year. Or I had another friend who, who has now stopped, uh, always used to leave the windows open in his um, flat, which happened to be in a kind of tower block. He always used to leave the windows open when he went to work, and now he, he doesn't. He shuts all the windows um, because the wind is often regularly like far too strong and like the whole of his inside of his house gets sort of turned upside down. Um, <clears throat> so I started to notice these kind of very minute, very um, uh, specific um, uh, ways of kind of knowing about sort of increasingly shifting weather events through one's domestic space. And this is really how I got interested um, in, in kind of everyday approaches to, to, to the climate crisis, to climate change. Um, and the second kind of key area of interest for me was also realizing very quickly that, that um, shifting weather uh, events or this sort of shifting weather patterns are a way through which, at least what I observed in Mombasa, through which um, uh, <clears throat> um, sort of ra so social divisions um, relating to race, class, gender, religion, are being both reinscribed and kind of troubled or contested um, in relation to the weather, I think. And again, I'll just give a couple of examples from, from Mombasa. Um, <clears throat> one thing that is very common in Mombasa is sort of very long-standing prejudices against the Somali community in the city are re-articulated um, in relation to um, uh, to drainage problems in the city so uh, with uh, there's more and more kind of torrential rain at different points of, this, of the year um, that floods the city and the people who are blamed for this are the kind of uh, unregulated Somali constructing uh, constructed um, people who work in the constructing, constructing sector um, who are sort of specifically blamed as as um, leaving the city kind of more vulnerable to um, to flooding because they're not following sort of building regulations as closely as others. So here I think we see sort of this intersection of old prejudices, old kind of forms of racism being sort of being mapped onto um, attempts to cope or to explain uh, uh, the, these sort of increasing, increasingly dramatic and frequent um, floods in the city. Um, and another final example is at the same time as we see these kind of um, old uh, racism, forms of discrimination being kind of entrenched um, in, in a moment of increasingly sort of fluctuating weather um, conditions. We also see kind of new forms of alliances. So I have met uh, friends who have for the first time kind of uh, got together with other neighbors who um, they've never sort of collaborated with um, on a political level before because of differences in race, class, gender, um, uh, religion and so on um, and have sort of got together with a range of different neighbors to petition um, state authorities to do something about the lack of regulation of the constructing se sector to do to improve drainage in the city and things like that so i think here again we see this kind of not necessarily the dis dissolution of social boundaries but the ways in which they're being to some extent superseded in a context of, of increasingly um, dramatic uh, uh, weather changes and and just um, just to finish, um, I'll say that the reason that I'm um, speaking to you, well, I think that's it, that's fine. Okay, um, can't wait, uh, really very much looking forward to, to meeting all of you during the course of our online um, symposium. And yeah, thanks so much for participating. I'm, I'm very excited to see what, um, both what comes out on the day, uh, your presentations, but also how we take this network um, forward. Thank you.